Then when the fruit been inspected, they put a stamp on the fruit. Says this is good. This is good. Says this right here, you can eat this. This is good. This is good. You hear me? This is good. Now as I start going through, and I see some fruit that don't Arkansas, this is Shepherd's Chapel with Pastor Arnold Murray. Join with us now as Pastor Murray takes you on a book by book, chapter by chapter, line by line study of God's Word. Now, here is Pastor Murray. All right, good day to you. God bless you. Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Praise God, we've been waiting on you. We're ready to get into the Word. We're going to leave the Psalms for a day or two. I want to get into a little different subject. As I told you, I was going to be speaking over this past weekend concerning politics. And I think about 95% of the people present said you must share that with the television family. So we're going to do that. We're going to just talk about them a little bit so that Bible students perhaps can have a better understanding of what our Father would have to say on this subject. So we're going to do that this evening. We just thank and ask His blessings upon this study. May give, He give us a word of wisdom whereby we can have better understanding in the name of Yahshua, Messiah, Jesus Christ. Amen. Politics means many things to many people. Many things come into mind. The picture of the little old senator with the black senator's hat on and, and the three-piece suit, and all raring to go, ready to talk at the drop of a hat. But what does it mean to you? And as a linguist, I would have you know, first of all, what does the word mean? Politics, or let's take political. What is the definition? The definition, basically, of politics or po that that is political, is to say the policies are concerning the policies of those that govern. That's the meaning of it the policies of those that govern. There are many, uh, in the uh, more modern Webster's, you'll find other definitions for meanings change. But basically, in the, in the uh, beginning, that's the definition. Then should you be familiar with the policies of those that govern in as much as you are a Christian? And how does that relate to the policies of our Father? What are his policies? We might just use the word policies instead of politics. We're going to run a thought along with how God's policies or politics relate to the policies or the politics of man as both govern. We could go to the beginning. I could give you probably 10 Hebrew words, Melka, one being king, and many others, but that mean govern or governor. We won't go into that. I'll spare you that. Uh, three, uh, I think it's three or four in the Greek that mean the head of or the governor of, well, even a wedding feast, such as when Jesus uh, performed his first miracle to turn water into wine. So we'll just let you, just to let you know, there are many words that mean governor or to govern in the manuscripts. But what we should do then is to understand what did our Father say about nations and their governments? What, what were His instructions to you? And we, we hope that we can ascertain these things, that we can ponder them a little bit. But most of all, as a Christian always should, everything Concerning all things is written in our Father's Word, if you know how to go in and get it. So that, that's what we will endeavor to do, perhaps a couple of lectures, this one and one following on this subject. There are 
many ways that we could approach this. But I think, first of all, we'll talk about the policies, those ways in which it was prophesied that Jesus would rule. And perhaps the best place for us to start is Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1. Let's cover it just a little bit and see if we can't find a better understanding concerning the policies or the politics of how Jesus would govern. Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 1. And there shall come forth a rod. Now, why would it use the word rod? You can call this a twig, a stem, but it's a rod to rule with. A rod out of the stem of Jesse and a branch shall grow out of his roots. This, of course, Jesse, son, David, the little fella that was out herding sheep, that the prophet anointed as a servant of the Most High. It was through this son of Jesse's that this rod would come forth, and he would rule with that rod as well. You'll all remember in Revelation chapter 19 where it states he comes as King of kings and Lord of lords to rule with a rod of iron, to govern. Then again, politics would be the policies by which he governs. And again, we'll be drawing um, analogies along with political governments uh, of this day, policies of government, so to speak. Verse 2, continuing. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel. Therefore, the the, one of the policies is that he would counsel, and it is from his word that we intend to draw counsel concerning these things, and I'll certainly take his counsel over man's. One of his policies was to counsel, and it's real sad that when people get all upset about things, they listen to this man here and this man there, the traditions of man concerning politics, and they don't find out what our father would say about it, what his policies were to govern. This counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord, that is to say, reverence. Now, first of all, I want to shake, I want you to shake from your mind all the things that you have been taught by traditions of man, not God. I said, don't forget them. Set them aside for a moment and listen to your father. Listen to his policies. Number one, when our forefathers came to this great nation, they had served under a government that was ruled by a church, and it was uh, meant through the writing of our the uh, declarations, the constitutions, that that would never happen again. And sometimes people overplay things. They jump from the fat into the fire. So they go too far the other way. You can go all down through history, the Reformation. Look at Spain in the 1400s and what a church can do to govern. We don't want that. At the same time, we don't want a government that controls a church. Now, for some reason, many Christians have been brainwashed into thinking that is what our Constitution states. It does not. Every Christian should be concerned about the policies of those that govern. It's even a commandment from God. We'll be covering it in the, this lecture and the one following. Okay, so those are, those are very rewarding and encouraging things. Many people paint Jesus and our Father as a God of love and a Son of love, and rightfully so, for they are. But yet if you love someone, you correct them. You get their attention, whether it be a nation or whether it be an individual. The same as you do when you govern your family, you either govern your children or you're going to have some mavericks. To govern, you must have chastisement. And God will chastise to whatever point is necessary to bring something in tow or uh, especially his election. He will cause them to submit one way or the other. It's according to how big, how large you want that rod to be each time he tries to get your attention. It'll get a little bigger each time. 
Verse 3, back to the thought, the policies in the prophecies concerning the rule of Christ. 3, and shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord, that is reverencing Yahweh, our Heavenly Father, and he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove. Now there's an interesting word. Do you know what to reprove means? It means to chastise, to correct. After the hearing of his ears, not man's ears, God's ears. You see, that's one reason that God is very fair. He doesn't need hearsay. He doesn't need witnesses. He knows what's in your heart and mind. That's why you, you can't hide anything from him. That's why you should never hesitate to repent. He knows already. Never let that be the reason alone you would repent. But repent from the heart. You can't con our Father. Four, and with righteousness shall he judge the poor. To judgment means reward for those that earn it. Let us continue. And reprove with equity for the meek of the earth and he shall smite. Just, now, he's a God of love, but at the same time, he carries a stiff hand. Smite. You might remember from our study in Psalm, Neganoff, in the Hebrew tongue means smitings, which you're warned of that you will receive if you get out of line with your father. He shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. So, it is prophesied that Jesus Christ shall slay the wicked, and so it is written. God had slain wicked from day one, utilizing his people in armies, utilizing his people as a police force to protect even the peace of the community, giving laws that were to be followed. Those are the policies of the living God. Well, I thought God was serving God was like floating around on a cloud playing a harp and he's saying sweet things. Well, we'll talk about that. We'll talk about that. The, as I stated yesterday, sometimes the way certain denominations uh, teach this fly away, fly on the cloud, you would think they were already angels the way they're always up in the air harping about something. Very angelic. So don't miss the point that it is with his mouth God wills. He also uses the mouths of his servants to bring logic and common sense into those that would serve him rather than allowing the traditions of men to twist their thinking. You do not need an interpreter to understand what one of your people ha have just said as an example. You really are qualified to understand if you use common sense. Usually the interpreter will twist the translation to fit their needs, not yours, and perhaps not the person that was speaking. Five, and righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins. That's his belt. That's what holds everything together. And faithfulness the girdle of his reins. Reins means the inside, the very thought from within. This faithfulness, are you faithful? That's what it's based on. He's always faithful. You can count on it. Don't count necessarily 100% on the faithfulness of man, for man will at times disappoint you. But God never shall neither, shall, neither shall the Son. His promises are written, and it shall come to pass, and he shall rule exactly as his, his um, policies are drawn forth here. So we can see the policies of our Father within this. Now, let's talk about some of the, the first law, perhaps, that was given, was given to Eve in Genesis, that she should not touch the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They were told that they could touch, not touch, but that they could partake 
of the fruit trees, but not this opposite of the tree of life, which Revelation 22 and Revelation uh, 2 declare the tree of life being Jesus Christ, identifying the tree of life as Jesus Christ, then naturally the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was, was Satan, none other, Satan. They were not to partake of him. He was the one that rebelled in the world that was and caused that world age to pass. They were given that law from our father's government. His policy, in other words, his politics, that policy was don't touch it. And poor little old Eve with Satan beguiling her brought forth a seed that would bruise the heel of this same Yeshua, but Yeshua would bruise his head. Then we could go on to Moses. Moses was given other laws. Noah was given laws. Let's go on to Moses, though, the Ten Commandments. The first five of God's policies were religious. The second five, making the ten, were civil, telling you how to get along in daily life. If you live by them, you won't have that much trouble. They're, um, basically, you're going to be in good shape. God will bless you. We all break them because we're not capable in the flesh of living by those policies set forth by our Father. Now, another one comes to mind, Jehu. What is it? Second Kings, I think, chapter 9. Now, here we see God's policies a little different. We'd had a, we, we had had a king that had disappointed our father, so our father gave us a ruler, Melchah, named Jehu. Jehu in the Hebrew tongue means the living. He's very special. Even a prophecy is drawn from that event, and I'm not going to go into it. It's a different subject for a different time. But in Hosea, what is it, chapter 2, I believe, 1 or 2, concerning Jehu and what happened in this incident I'm about to tell. Very prophetic and was drawn from again. Well, what, what was this that Jehu was told to do? It's one of the little covert actions of our father. Our father told Jehu to lie. Oh my goodness, what did that man say? I said, our father told Jehu to lie. Inasmuch as Jehu was instructed to take all those that were Baal worshipers, pretending to be a Baal worshiper himself. God would do that? He did, yes to pretend to be a Baal worshiper himself. So he went to that great Baal, temple of Baal, rather, of that time, and he said, I only want in this building those that truly love and respect Baal. I only want the very staunchest of followers up. Boy, when you talk about a covert deal, now this was one in living action, one of our father's policies. So, Jehu, I won't mention little Yonadab, the Kenite that he picked up and took into his chariot on the way to all the Kenite knew what Jehu was going to do, and he wanted his seed clear of this. Real sharp, always on the inner, the, the uh, reins of the situation, which is to say in the Hebrew, the inner part, inner, the, the inner knowledge, controlling knowledge. So Jehu then, after all the Baalite, and he being there representing himself as a Baal worshiper, uh, with all inside, he told his troops, kill every last one of them, and they did. So real, that was part of the smiting done by the people of God. And so it goes on and on. This is why Jesus, in one sense, in Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21, said, as long as you hear of wars and rumors of wars, don't worry. The seven things, the seven seals, shall not yet be ready to consummate to bring in my return. So these things are going to happen before that. So his people naturally are supposed to war and will have rumors of war 
fighting off the enemy, which the enemy being what? The enemy of our people is that one that was mentioned way on back in Genesis, what is it, chapter 27, where Esau sold his birthright and the blessings were being passed out. Jacob was to become a nation of nations, a glory and a blessing to God. And poor old Esau had nothing. And he asked for a blessing and was told through his father, yes, you shall have a blessing also. You shall be a great nation, Esau. You will live by the sword, but you will die by the sword. You see, this is all God's policy I'm talking about, his politics. No different to a linguist. You understand? No different to a linguist. So, Esau, through his migrations, goes to the, called the land of Edom, begins his migrations north, settled in the north, and he is that great superpower mentioned in, Revel in uh, Ezekiel chapter 38 and 9, chief prince of Meshech in the Hebrew manuscripts Rosh, R-O-S-H, which later by the Volga was called R-U-S-H, I'm sorry, R-U-S-S, -S, Rush, and today is called Rusha. There's no great mysteries when you go to your Father's Word and accept this counsel that was promised in the policy of Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit will reveal the knowledge to you and give you an inner understanding of these events, these policies, both of man and God, because it is all within the plan of the living God. So Jehu then gave us, not one of the first by any means, but a very covert uh, uh, operation that God ordered those people murdered, not murdered, killed, destroyed, done away with, unfit. Uh, so within that, we see our Father's hand. Now, at the same time, it is well to remember that you do not take a little knowledge build a religion or go ape over it, all right? You must keep everything in its perspective. Well, we know that Esau is the bad one now. We know that Russia is bad. We know that atheistic communism is the government, the system, that is the policy of the land that the mass uh, control. Now, that's the policy, but the mass don't control very few in the Politburo control another form of politics called communism. That's the policy of Esau. You do not follow the policies of a, a zealous person that might say destroy all communism then. You don't do that, friend. As a Christian, you do it God's way. You take upon yourself to learn all the policies of our Father and understand where your priorities are. If a thing is written that it shall come to pass, then if you try or you attempt to prevent the overall move of that, then you will be getting in the way of God. But the same as God gives you the right to protect your family by killing a, an, an intruder that means harm and malice to your family scot-free so that others will see in fear and these things will cease to happen among you. What do I mean? That people will stop breaking in other people's house if a few of them are blowing away. They'll find that doesn't pay. People are very intelligent. They understand God's policy a lot quicker than they do man's. God doesn't plea bargain. Okay, not to get off the subject, but you must understand your father's plan, whereas a servant, you can know when he will utilize you what conflicts or what you are to stand against. And you must remember primarily from the New Testament, we are to use that sword of the mouth, which is to say God's truth, to gain that, w that we would, unless Esau jumps out of his roost, con roost his habitation, contrary to what is written in God's plan such as he is in Central America. According to God's plan, he doesn't belong in Central America, so we have the right to put a stop to it. Do you understand? In other words, you must have your priorities in order. You must understand the policies, or if I may, the politics of God. Again, no difference to a linguist. 
so that you don't get in God's way and you do it His way, else you will not have His blessings. But if you do it with His blessings, I assure you, you will have the victory, as we will have victory ridding Central America of communism. We will have the victory, for it is not predicted by God that it will be south of us, not Timon, but north, Russia. So we can learn a great deal. Then we must realize that keeping our priorities straight and keeping everything using common sense and heeding our Father's word, I would have us turn to Daniel chapter 2. Minor prophets, just uh, before the minor prophets rather. Daniel, that great prophet of prophets. Let's go to chapter 2. Let's take it with verse 20. Daniel has been given the meaning of the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had. Listen to it. Chapter 2, the book of Daniel, verse 20. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. Don't ever forget that. All wisdom comes from God. Now the verse that we wanted. And he changeth. He's in control, friend. Do you understand? Our Father is in control. He changeth the times and the seasons. He removeth kings. He removeth governors. He removeth leaders and setteth up kings. He puts them in office. He giveth wisdom unto the wise and knowledge to them that know understanding. So our Father is very able our Father is in control. It is His policy to set up kings and to remove kings. Why? Daniel is prophecy. These leaders would be put in position in these certain governments and places to fulfill the plan of God. Therefore, common sense being, when you look at uh, being very factual, it's going to happen the way it's written. To stay out of God's way, you understand His plan, allow the wisdom and knowledge of those facts with the guidance of the Spirit to make you a servant. Well, the Spirit tells me everything. God hates a lazy person. That's a cop-out. If anybody ever says they never have to study God's Word because the Spirit gives them everything, get rid of them. Get away from them. That's nonsense. It goes against the policies of our Father. It goes the against the policies of the Holy Spirit, which mean they're lying to you. They're deceived themselves, so they can't help you, friend. Our Father gives counsel. Listen to Him and not nuts, okay? Because that's what they are, quite frankly. Bearing this in mind, a lot would go... Uh, let me show you how people are. A lot of people, on understanding that, are saying, well, God's going to do whatever He wants to anyway. We don't have to do anything. Wrong. What if Jehu had taken that attitude? God calls people to serve Him. What would, where would we be today in this great nation, America, even in this hemisphere with our neighbors, had we taken that attitude many years ago and never made a defense to, to design a nation under God. We wouldn't be able to do what we're doing right now to study His Word. So you must use common sense and you must have priorities. Priorities drawn from the policy or the politics that govern in Almighty God's uh, overall plan. For I hope you get the point by now, man's policies or politics only fall under that that God allows. God, after all, overall sets up. But He utilizes His servants to accomplish that. Are you a servant of God? Well, my goodness, you're laying in quite a trip. I was told all I ever had to do was go to church. And you have a brain, don't you use it? Do you, do you think that going to church once a week or maybe once a week and Wednesday night's going to get you into heaven? Do you think that's serving God? That's only the time that you are supposed to be instructed. And I reiterate, supposed to be instructed. Unfortunately, 
Our people are starving sheep because God's Word is not being taught. You're only hearing the traditions of man. I only, I only know of about one or two other ministers that would tell you as I'm telling it to you now, straight out. They would say, well, they're going to accuse me of teaching politics and I'm going to be unpopular <clears throat> because they don't know what politics really means. They picture the smoke-filled room and the, the um, uh, cheating and so on and so forth that some, some have caused politics to have the reputation of. It still doesn't change the meaning that is the poli politics or the policy of those that govern. And you better take an interest in the policies of those that govern. That's why you have a vote in this great nation. You will never see this man interfere in partisan politics. And so that no one misunderstands what I'm talking about, and I, don't, I'm, I apologize if anyone might think I'm talking down to you, what is partisan politics? Partisan politics is, let us say, the various parties in politics. You'll never hear me mention this party or that party and tell you that you should do this. But when it comes to the policies of this great nation that guarantees with its constitution taken from this word of God, I will take part proudly. And every Christian should. When it puts in, when any event comes up that would put in danger our rights to follow the policies of Almighty God. Okay, with that thought in mind then, that God puts in power whoever he should. Well, now, wait a minute, wait a minute. God said that we're to love our neighbors and we're to love our enemy, and here you're telling us that he might actually get down to the point that he might want us to illustrate a little force at one time or the other. That's exactly what I'm saying. You are to get along with your neighbor if it is possible. If it's not possible, in love, you're supposed to correct him, reprove him. Well, as an example, when the Contras, when we have neighbors to the South that Russia has absolutely transferred a communist regime to Managua, we're supposed to reprove them or at least help our neighbor do unto our neighbor as we would hope they would do unto us if it were to be attempted right here in this great free land where you couldn't have a church and they would shoot your preachers down like dogs. That's what we're talking about, reality. What did God really say about getting along with your neighbor? If you can't, if you can't understand the, the nitty gritty of it, I want to cover one more verse. I want to cover the, I want you to go to the New Testament, the book of Romans, chapter 12. I want you to read the 18th verse in closing. The 18th verse states, if it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. But that's only if it's possible. Well, what did, uh, teacher, just tell me exactly what does that mean? It means simply this. If it's possible, get along with somebody peaceably. And if you can't, love them enough that you'll correct them. If they begin to move into your territory, you do more than correct with words. You correct your own and your right that God's house can be protected. God's house is his many-membered body. They're all precious. And any citizen that knows the policy, that is, has knowledge of the policies of our Father will move forward to protect those rights and freedoms whereby the plan of the living God shall continue and shall fulfill itself as it is written. Do we have control of that? No, we don't have to. God is in control, but he's calling forth a people. What, how does this affect an evangelist? It doesn't affect at all. An evangelist's job is to evangelize, that is to teach the gospel, the milk, and bring people into the truth. Then teachers are, are 
responsible and pastors for taking people into the meat of God's Word as we have done in this session, whereby they know where Christians should stand in national politics and international politics. Our Father doesn't leave anything out. Then, rather than listening to man, you can base your understanding on the Word of God. Well, bless your hearts. We're going to stop there for this lecture. Don't miss the next one. We'll probably complete this topic there. But understand, politics means the policies are having to do with the policies of those that govern. I hope you're interested in that because you are the entity that's being governed. If you love your, your family, if you care for your country, you should be very interested, especially if any of your rights are put in danger. Your father expects you to. Okay, bless your hearts. You listen a moment. I want to share something with you. Well, beloved, I want to share with you the Companion Bible. Of all Bibles, I recommend this as a study Bible. You know, we have the King James, and it's a beautiful work. Here's the King James with a parallel column, leather bound, and in the back of this wonderful Bible, you have 198 appendixes. Appendix taking you into 198 in-depth studies. Now, as an example, Genesis. Uh, now we go to the front of the, the companion Bible. In Genesis, uh, you see eight verses, and then you see explanation in the column. Beloved, you as an English reader, it takes you back into the Hebrew, allowing you to see and understand that in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, period, that millions of years passed. For in verse 2, tuhu vabuhu, yes, you, the English reader, can read the Hebrew from the manuscripts, showing you how that the world became void and without form, not that it was created void and without form. A Bible that any English reader uh, can easily understand. You see it there on your screen. I hope you can make that out. Tuhu vabuhu. It became waste. So here you have a study tool that takes you from the milk and puts you into dead center meat. Uh, and how precious it is to have those tools available, including Masara, including um, uh, including those appendix that go into so much depth, so much truth. We just thank our Father for this beautiful Bible. It is yours for a donation of $100 to the chapel to help you study deeper, more depth into God's Word. Okay, bless your heart. $100 gift in the Bible. We just want to send it to you. God bless you. All right, bless your hearts, we're back. Say, so, hey, let's get up the 800 numbers if we can here. You got a question, you got a comment, you feel free to get on the horn, give us a call. 1-800-643-4645 in this great state of Arkansas, 787-5556. All right, God bless you. Let's get into our prayers. And from Alabama, prayer request. All right. And uh, I understand your prayer, Clara from... Pennsylvania, okay, from, for your mother, and I understand, the, okay, and who do we have here? Okay, I don't have, don't seem to have a name. Do you have a special request for prayer, my mother? Oh, this is a part of this one, yes, this is Claire. Okay, concerning her mother, okay, Maurice, no, Mar Mary Ann from Pennsylvania. Okay, she thanks us for the words we spoke yesterday, yesterday regarding guilt. That would have been Friday. That seemed to be for me. Please pray for our brothers and sisters, okay? Uh, Marianne from Pennsylvania. And then we have Sharon from Canada. And uh, I believe this is a question, isn't it? Okay. Okay, I'm going to set that aside, and if there is a prayer, we'll include it. Okay, this is um, Melvin. He has a heart condition and a grandson. Okay, we seem to have a lot of prayers over the weekend. Here's Cindy from Pennsylvania. All right, Cindy, Mark from Tennessee. 
Mark, we did uh, uh, get your prayer request, and it was handled, but we're going to we're going to do that. We're going to include it again because I know she's I know she's doing better. We'll just see how it goes here. Um, I mean, we'll do it again uh, because of the request. Barbara from West Virginia. All right, have your prayer request. And Diane, prayer. All right. And Melvin, no location. Rhonda. All right. And. Um, from Mobile, Alabama, Albertine. And another one yet, Jeanette. Prayer for a brother. And here, just in, uh, 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 let's see, in other words, this from Tennessee. From Tennessee, would you give me the name on that, please? And I'll include it. Okay. The first name only. And, um, and I need it right now, please. All right, we'll take these prayers to our Father. We'll include Warren on this and uh, his prayer request. Father, you hear the prayers of the children. Look down, give credentials to your word of truth. In Jesus' precious name, amen, amen. Our Father loves his children so much. Now I'm going to drop back up here and we're going to pick uh, Sharon up from Ontario. I understood you to say that there were no women in the world that was, yet it says in Romans 1, 26, that the women gave up the natural use of the women unto the witches against uh, nature. Yes, but not uh, this particular verse does not have to do with the world that was, okay? Part of it does, part of it doesn't. But that particular part doesn't. I would request that you take your companion Bible. It has an appendix on the son of, sons of God. Study that in appendix. It's quite lengthy as far as the research, and I think you'll feel real good about that. June from Oklahoma. What is the difference between a democracy and a republic? That's a, that's a very interesting question. Uh, how can I simplify this? First of all, let, let me just ask, many people don't understand what type of government we have. They, they don't really know that much about government. And they would say, as I've heard it many times through these Contra hearings, that uh, this, they say we need democracy, we need democracy, we need democracy. This is not a democracy. This American government is not a democracy. A democracy is a, I'm going to give you the definitions, is where a mass of people meet and come to a conclusion, all right? That is their um, policy. A republic is where the people elect officials by state or county, whatever, to represent them then those elected meet and, and uh, perform the policies of the government. Um, I might say our, our salute to our flag or our pledge to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic, to the what? To the republic for which it stands, one nation. We are a republic, and there's a great difference. I know people uh, do that in ignorance, so be it. Now, that doesn't have anything to do with the Democratic Party and the Republican Party, all right? Don't try to start playing partisan politics on I me. Mean, you sharpen up. That is the difference in a democracy and a republic, which has nothing to do with those parties. We are a republic, and praise God for it. As a matter of fact, communism, were it to be true, and it isn't, as it were it to rule, be ruled by the mass coming to one conclusion, then you would see a democracy in that sense. That isn't the way it is at all. For very few rule out of the masses. They are controlled people. Okay, Chuck from Mississippi. Why? Did the devil dispute with Michael wanting Moses' body? All right, uh, what Chuck is talking about as it is written in the book of Jude, 
that he did this. I want you to, I want you to make a note of Deuteronomy chapter 34, verses, say, 5 and 6. And I want you to figure out who buried Moses. And then you'll understand why David, I'm sorry, why, um, God forbid, why Ju the Satan disputed with Judah uh, or uh, with, um, uh, for Mos Michael, rather, the archangel over Moses' body because God buried him. Explain why did God want 4,000, wait rather, 4,000 years before Christ came? Because it was his plan. Those events that were prophesied had to come to pass exactly as they were written, giving each soul an opportunity to pass through this earth age one time. It is given to man to die once in the flesh. That's all. There's no such thing as reincarnation. Anytime someone says they are reincarnate, they've got it, they're demon possessed. It was the demon that was in a flesh body years before or whatever. So there it is. It's according to God's plan. God is unfair then because uh, salvation was not available to those? Quite the contrary. Jesus, while in the tomb, went to those people and offered them the same, the same salvation. Many of them accepted it. Toby from Nevada, is there a lesson for us in that the name Judas and Judah resembled each other so much? I think probably you're saying, uh, you're thinking of Judas Iscariot with Judah the patriarch. But uh, really, no. As a matter of fact, when you say Judas, all you're saying, you're speaking Greek then. And for the Hebrew word Judah, they're both exactly the same word. What I'm saying is one is Greek and the other is Hebrew, but you're saying the exact same thing. Okay, Wilma from Washington. Is it possible for one or even two out of the same parents to be a Kenite? Like a family of five, two of three be a Kenite if... Uh, Neither parent was a Kenite. We enjoy the program. No, no, no. The Kenites are the sons of Cain. That's a race. Do you understand? A race. It's not a moral issue uh, of the, uh, whether someone is good or bad, uh, something of that nature. It is a racial issue. Am I a racist? No. There are just different races. God created us that way. But that doesn't mean he's a racist. But the Kenites are a race. And if you have, if the mother is a Kenite and the father is not, then they're half. If both parents are Kenite, all of them are. Unless there's a Kenite in the woodshed, all right? If you understand what I mean, I just uh, perhaps did not need to clarify that. But it's a racial thing. You can't have part of your brothers and sisters, Kenites and not. Okay, Ryan from Indiana. Please comment on the book of leaks Congressman Hyde had. It was to the press from the Congress. Well, uh, Ryan, I can't comment on it because I, didn't, I haven't seen it. And I doubt, I can assure you, I don't think Congressman Hyde's going to share it with anyone. It was just that I'm quite sure that um, as anyway has been saying there were no leaks in Congress. It seems that anyway has been pushing that pretty good. And um, Congressman Hyde was just showing anyway that he had documentation that there had been leaks. Uh, perhaps we'll get an opportunity to ask him more about it. Uh, Congressman Hyde, if we can, if we're fortunate enough to have him here with us a Saturday, uh, August the 8th, um, I'll keep you posted if it does uh, pan out. It will be special programming, uh, not scheduled at this time, but if it's scheduled, we'll all take notice and make sure you're off at that time. Gary from Idaho, in reference to the New Testament, what do you mean when you say the Trump? I only heard the last part of the teaching on the rapture, and you mentioned the Trump. I can't find anything in the New Testament about a Trump. This is my first time to ever listen to the program. Well, Gary, God bless you. It's good to have you with us, and I hope that you are, this would have been the 19th. I hope you're listening the 20th. 
uh, here up through this live portion. Um, try, I want you to make a note, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 52, and you will read there of the last trump. That's when we all change into our spiritual bodies. The last trump is the last trumpet. What is the, the Greek is very specific. Last means the furthest out and the finality of the sounding of trumps, period, in this earth age. It means that we will all be changed into a spiritual body at that time. It is mentioned in other places in God's Word, and that's why I recommend that everybody have a strong concordance. To understand there, you would only have had to look up the word trump. It would have, give you, have given you the scriptures in which it was used, and it would have also told you in the Greek, the Greek word uh, that was used there to be trump, which is actually trumpet. Okay, Marcia uh, from Oregon. Being from a Mormon background, I don't understand the Trinity. Please explain. We have always believed that the offices were separate. We have learned so much from your teaching, and we listen all the time. Well, uh, Marsha, a wise man doesn't try to explain the Trinity because whoever hears it understands it in different ways. I teach it as Christ did. That's the only way I can do it because I think that's the only way we have ever any hope of even getting close to understanding the Godhead. Jesus taught the offices of our Father. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father, he stated, and uh, so on and so forth. But to, again, fulfill his prophecies through the Spirit, the Godhead uh, had three offices. Um, Okay, Clifford, where in the Bible does it mention the black race? Well, it, um, it, it mentions the black race several times through the word. When does it first mention them? In the first chapter of Genesis, where the, man, where the races were created on the sixth day. The, fi the final race being created on the eighth day. Acquire our tapes on Genesis, the first six chapters. There are two tapes. And it goes into detail. I know no, uh, no one else that I know of teaches in this way. I would advise, though, acquire the tapes or listen to it sometime when we're teaching Genesis on television. Check your schedule. And uh, you will see uh, that it is well documented what the word I have just stated. There, were, there was another race brought into existence, but it was a race of hybrids not created by God. Never let anyone pass off the fact that Ham was the father of the black people. That is a lie. Don't you ever say our black brothers were created by a sin such as that. What was the sin? Ham looked upon his father's nakedness, which if you read Levi, the, uh, the book of um, Leviticus, you find in chapter 18, verse 8, that to uncover your father's nakedness is to lie with your father's wife. That is not what our brought our black brothers into existence. The races created on the sixth day were created. The one on the eighth was formed. That is the difference. God had created all races. He looked upon them, and he was proud. And that's why that no one had ever better apologize about their race to me, or you'll get corrected. Short order. Okay, Ray from Missouri. What does the Bible say about man going to and being in outer space? He heard one preacher say the Bible said that man would make his nest among the stars. Okay, the Bible's written in the stars. The Bible doesn't say anything about man going into outer space. It does talk about outer space coming here and as much as the vehicle that our Father's throne appeared to Ezekiel uh, in, and Ezekiel 1 was a highly polished bronze dish-shaped object with windows and a landing gear, yes, even. Okay, a uh, person was very disturbed, no name. What does the Bible say about divorce? Well, you have... Um, first of all, let's take the fact that you were disturbed. Don't be disturbed. Take your, be patient. If you 
God doesn't like divorce as it is written in the New Testament, in the, rather the minor prophets, he hates it. But under certain circumstances, because man is sinful, for certain reasons, divorce was granted. And uh, my advice to you is study God's word, love each other, and share that love, and um, uh, et cetera. Okay. Um, just um, know when, when the divorce is coming and somebody doesn't want it, that's the time to let your love be true. Let it hang out. Well, don't be afraid to express it. Um, okay. The man asked the man asked a pastor if it was okay to look at phonographic magazines or watch Playboy Channel. The pastor said it was okay. What is your opinion? He said it when it started to get to him, he wouldn't turn it off and he wasn't lusting. Well, it's uh, you know what we eat is what our body is. In other words, if you eat food that is not that God did not create for food, which is to say meats that are not considered food because God didn't call them food, and you get real sick, it's because of what you took into your body, and your body gets sick. It's according to what you take into your mind as to whether your mind is sick or not. Willie from Florida. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. Please explain so I can understand. When does the judgment take place? Okay, if you'll all remember, Hebrews 9.27 is a statement. I quoted it earlier. It is given, it, uh, you are appointed, every man is appointed once to die, and then the judgment, because you go from there directly to the judgment. Okay, Isaiah 6, that is to say, paradise awaiting judgment. 66.22, please explain. Uh, it, it's a figure of speech that means children of Israel will live forever. St. John, Jesus said, you must be born again. It stays in the Greek, you must be born from above, means of the water of woman. Okay, bless your hearts. Hey, I'm out of time. God bless you. I hope you've enjoyed this uh, lecture on policy. We'll pick it up here in the next one. If we've taught you, you support us. We're supported by your tithes and your offerings. You help us if you can. Won't you do that? But the main thing, you stay in your Father's Word Every day in it is a beautiful day for a very simple reason. Jesus Christ, our Savior, He is the living Word. Thank you for joining with us in today's study of God's Word. If you would like to hear today's message again on audio cassette. Or if you would like to know some of the other deeper, in-depth studies that Pastor Murray has covered, write for the free tape 